On today's episode of the 2020 Awards Podcast, we've asked our guest, editor Stuart Schill, to share with us what he believes is an example of great editing. Stuart suggested we go back and rewatch Annie Hall. Hi. 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 Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> well, bye. <laughs> you, you play very well. Oh, yeah? So do you. Oh, God, what a, what a dumb thing to say, right? I mean, you say it, you play well, and then right away, I have to say you play well. Oh, oh, God, Annie. Well, oh, well. <laughs> la-di-da, la-di-da, la-la, yeah. As an editor, our guest has cut feature films, episodic shows, and pilots, though most recently his editing work can be seen on American Horror Story, Battlestar Galactica, and Dexter. He's also currently wrapping up post-production on his second feature film that he also directed, Frank vs. God. Welcome back to the show, Stuart. Thank you. Great to be here. Annie Hall was released in 1977. It won four Academy Awards, including Best Actress for Diane Keaton, Best Picture, and Best Script, and Director for Woody Allen. The film follows Woody Allen through a series of relationships that he's unable to commit to. He's repeatedly drawn to the character of Annie Hall, played by Keaton, but ultimately Woody's a victim of the Groucho Marx adage, I wouldn't want to belong to any club that would have me as a member. (laughs) The film was edited by Ralph Rosenblum. So, Stuart, I introduced you as an editor, but you're also a writer and a director. And so it's really no surprise to me that you chose this film, because it really is a great example, I think, of how those three... uh, areas of, of expertise kind of blend with one another. Um, but is there a specific reason you picked Annie Hall? Yeah, well, there's a couple of reasons I chose Annie Hall, but, um, you know, the, the biggest reason was because you asked me to pick an example of great editing or speak about editing, and I think what I said to you was, come on, Chris, the only thing more boring than editing is talking about editing, <laughs> which... I know it sounds very uh, uh, dismissive, but of something that is an extraordinary, you know, craft and an art, I should say. Kuleshov would strike you dead. Yes, right. I, I should strike myself dead. But <laughs> there's a truth of what I say, which is editing is, uh, you know, it's always called the invisible art. It's really, it's you know, when it's done well, you don't notice it. You right. don't see it. Right. Um, and even, you know, I'm now, I've been editing a long time. I'm an ace. I'm like, you know, in that echelon where it's like we're now asked to judge other people's editing. Right. You can't tell. You, you know, you look at something and, you know, you can't tell if it's well edited. I mean, you can tell if it's badly edited. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you never know what somebody's working with. You know, so, you know, arguably, and I've been on so many of these movie shows, you know, the worst shows have the best editing because you're solving a million problems and making stuff that was crap into, you know, something that's better than crap. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Michael Kahn or somebody who cut Steven Spielberg's stuff, I mean, you know, how challenging is that, right? <laughs> <laughs> how hard can that be? I mean, I'm sure it is. And I don't, I'm yeah. not diminishing, you know, the great Michael Kahn. May he strike me down. But... Uh, the point is the same, which is editing is really difficult to talk about. And even, uh, you know, another thing it reminds me of is I've gone on a million interviews where, you know, you're interviewing with producers to for a job, and it's like nobody knows how to talk about editing. So I always try to turn those interviews and conversations into talking about music. You know, I feel like a big contribution I make, you know, on any job is that I feel like I'm really good with music and how to use it. And, and really those interviews are mostly... Um, People just wanting to see, do I want to spend a lot of time in a dark room with this dude? So, right, you know, right. but edit, the point being that editing is hard to talk about. So when you asked me to speak about editing, I thought of Annie Hall for a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, it is a big touchstone seminal movie to me. It's a movie that, you know, it's definitely a Desert Island movie to me that, that sort of changed my cinematic life. But I know that the legend of, Woody, of um, Annie Hall is that it was really made in the editing room. Right. And uh, I don't know how well known this is, but it's an interesting story. So, and actually in preparation for this podcast, you know, I revisited Ralph Rosenblum, wrote a, a very seminal book about editing and mostly focusing on, he edited all of uh, the early Woody Allen films up through Interiors, which was the one right after Annie Hall. Um, and uh, his book's kind of a classic, and it's really interesting if you are interested in, you know, the art Yeah, what's thing. the name of that? It's called When the Shooting Stops, the Cutting Begins. Right. right. Um, and the chapter on Annie Hall was a real eye-opener to me as, you know, like a young film student and stuff. And by the way, the only reason I got into editing, which I know you know, is because we all had a, uh, a mentor at CalArts, the great Sandy Alexander McKendrick, mm-hmm. 
who was this crotchety old British guy who, you know, really had all these rules about filmmaking, but he really drilled this into our heads, which is, if you want to learn how to make movies, you should edit them. That's how you really learn how movies are made, which is very, very true and very much uh, on an honored tradition in the British film industry. And you think about David Lean, um, I'm sure there are many more. <laughs> <laughs> no. just, just David Lean. Yeah. <laughs> but they were all editors before they became filmmakers. And that's, that's the path there is so not the case in Hollywood. Editors are much more um, disregarded and looked down upon and, and less, you know, less revered. But um, anyway, I took Sandy's advice to heart and I um, credit that with ruining my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, anyway, but the interesting thing about Annie Hall, so in preparation for this, I reread the Ralph Rosenblum uh, book about this and also was just doing some research and it's interesting to see that Annie Hall, which is a movie that I love and consider just such a masterpiece and obviously swept the Oscars in 1977, Woody Allen considers it its biggest failure. He considers it a disaster and still a painful memory of, of something that he completely failed at. So that is really interesting to see how um, the movie... That does, he, does he say why? Yeah, because the movie that he intended to make was a completely different movie. It was a murder mm. mystery. It had a murder mystery that was one element of it. It had many elements, actually, which he then later mined and reused. You know. uh, the, the murder mystery element of Annie Hall became... Manhattan murder Manhattan mystery. Manhattan murder mystery with Diane Keaton many years later. There was a whole sequence about going to uh, taking an elevator to hell, which, which is uh, a dis- became deconstructing, deconstructing Harry. Harry. And I, there's two or three more strands that he just, you know, Ditched. reused. Yeah, but, you know. Save for reused. later. Put the bank. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the original story that, uh, that, Annie, that Woody Allen and Marshall Brickman wrote was titled, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, Anhedonia, A-N-H-E-D-O-N-I-A which is a terrible title and is a clinical term for someone that is in, incapable of experiencing pleasure. Okay. Very commercial title. <laughs> <laughs> so they'd written this movie called Anadonia, and, um, and the concept of it, from what I understand, and the, the really painful thing is nowadays we're all so used to uh, um, digital editing and saving every version. Back then, you were cutting on work prints, and no print of this movie exists because right. they tore it apart yeah. to make the new one. So. Yeah. It's cool that Ralph Rosenblum wrote this book and sort of details his memory of it, and maybe someday they will go and recreate that. But um, anyway, uh, the original story was supposed to be like a interior monologue, very much stream of consciousness of a Woody Allen character who's in a, uh, incapable of experiencing pleasure, and it's hopscotching around from his childhood memories, and it would go in these big diversions. I mean, there's this, this that great sequence in the uh, classroom where we're used to, like, you know, I used to be a methadone <laughs> heroin addict, now I'm a methadone. But th- each one of those would go off into a tangent where they visited their lives now. And, right. Um, a lot of childhood memories. Um, the uh, relationship with the first wife, and, um, who was the Carol Kane character. Gosh, she was adorable. Um, and the second wife, who was the intellectual, I can't remember the actress who played her, um, were given equal weight with the Annie Hall character. Um, and there was a whole diversions into uh, a Nazi subplot, you know, with, <laughs> because one of the themes that oh Woody God. Allen wanted to explore was, you know, um, h- how his character would stand up under real tests of character. And right. so there's this whole plot where he's, yeah, there was a murder mystery and something with the, him being, you know, interrogated by Nazis and everything. Um, there's a famous scene where he's uh, with the, the second wife at the intellectual party, and oh, he right, right. ditches off into yeah. the bedroom to watch the Knicks game. Yeah, and it goes into a whole subplot where he imagines playing basketball with, you know, Kierkegaard and all these great philosophers, right. and so it went off in all these directions. And and it was a very dark movie of which the relationship with Annie Hall was really just one strand. Yeah, and evidently when they sat to look at the movie, which the first cut was nearly three hours long, um, that's all. Yeah, I'm I seriously like based on what I'm, you're talking about. It's like it feels like I know I thought the same thing, series. which is you would have thought it'd be even more. Yeah. But um, uh, they were despondent, and especially Marshall Brickman was like, "We can't yeah. release this. We, yeah. You know, I got to take my name off it. What am I going to do?" Yeah. So it really became Woody Allen and Ralph Rosenblum kind of hunkering down, and saying, "How are we going to salvage this thing?" And it was a real slow process of winnowing it down. And you know, the first big sort of epiphany was. We need to focus on Annie Hall. 
we need to get to the present story of Annie Hall uh, within the first like 15 minutes or so. And then, you know, some flashbacks after that, but we need to know where the, where we're, this story is going right, to take place. Right. Um, and then really like some painful letting go of stuff that he obviously loved because he then he made them, them later. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I thought it was just such a great illustration. I mean, the editing in this movie uh, technically is, is pretty tame because, and actually that was another thing that was very striking watching it again, was that um, the stuff was so well executed. I mean, like stuff that to me would be terrifying now, these long master shots oh yeah split screens and stuff where and and especially the famous scene where he's in line and the guy is talking about Marshall (laughs) McLuhan that scene goes on forever it goes on forever but the way it was done but it doesn't feel like it I mean it it, it, well it kind of (laughs) does it works is the point yeah it works but but what's amazing about that and you know you can appreciate this which is it's not just him and Diane Keaton riffing off each other they got this guy you know, going on in the background and knowing when to pipe up and when to kind of calm down and try to keep it naturalistic so that he can get his joke off but then jump right in. And, like, the timing is incredible. It really is, yeah. And to do that all in one shot without coverage is, like, that is definitely, you know, a tight wire rack without a net. I mean, that's incredible. No, I was was thinking the same thing when I was watching it. It was just like, oh, my God, the scene is going on forever. And it's like they're just... But it's it's not boring, but it's just, like, there is that element of, like, as a filmmaker, you watch it and go, like, when are they going to trip? When are they going to cut? They're yeah. going to have to cut to cover this somehow. And it's right. like, no, it's, it all no, plays does out. Does Woody Allen do that because he doesn't have the budget to, to do a lot of angles? No, it's definitely a choice. Yeah. I think he's just like, I think he knows the material is strong and it's like, it's just going to play need... better in a wide. Mm-hmm. Well, I think he knows that. And he, um, but the thing that's most striking to me is just the confidence of knowing that this is going to play because we are so accustomed to as filmmakers always hedging our bets and always having places to go. I mean, it's like, what if you looked at this scene? And by the way, that's such a... And you saw somebody in the background that just is totally distracting. Well, not only that, I was going to say, what if, you know, halfway through this three and a half minute scene, you know, I just, one of those jokes didn't work. Doesn't I want to cut that one joke. Yeah. You can't. Nope. You it's know? all or nothing. Yeah, it's all yeah. or nothing. Yeah. And that is brave and confident. And actually, it was an interesting You were going to little... say ballsy. <laughs> I see you were, thinking you? ballsy. Yeah. You defined yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Uh, It was an interesting detail in the Rosenblum book about, um, you know, it was a a long process of, you know, kind of finding the movie and really making it in the editing, which is, you know, you hear that a lot, but this one it is really true. Um, They have to go back and reshoot much of it? They did reshoot some stuff, but but more importantly, I I don't think they actually had to reshoot stuff as much as they had to come up with a few bridges. Right. So, like, there's a very famous scene um, in the movie where... um, Woody Allen sneezes in the cocaine, right. which, and, and he talks about, this is an editing thing too, which is um, in the test screenings, that got the biggest laugh in the movie. That's like a laugh out loud moment. And they literally had to keep extending the tail of that so that the audience could get their laugh out and catch up, right. which um, reminds me of a, a really famous Billy Wilder story, which is my favorite Billy Wilder story about when he was making Some Like It Hot. Um, there's the great scene where uh, Jack Lemmon comes in from a night out when he's uh, in oh, like, the yeah. Mex- he's yeah, got yeah. the maracas yeah, yeah, yeah. and he's yeah. talking to Tony Curtis so apparently Billy Wilder says to uh, Jack Lemmon on the day he's like okay uh, when you tell a story I want you to hold these maracas and in between each line shake the maracas and Jack Lemmon's like what? he's like trust me and so he did it and he's just like shake 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 he really didn't know why he was doing it yeah. and I'm, I did this special about Lemmon and he's like he didn't understand it and then when he saw the film it made total sense because every one of those lines was such a screamer and Billy Wilder knew it was going to be such a screamer that he needed something to be able to time out the rhythm of the laughs to not step on the next setup. And the Maracas, I think that's the best directing story I've ever heard. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, Well, you touched a little bit about the Marshall McLuhan thing. Yeah. Like one of the things that I think this movie does better than I think so many other movies that try it is like two things. One is it, it breaks the fourth wall. And it seems effortless. And it's just like when it happens, when, when Woody Allen addresses the camera, like in the middle of the movie, yeah, you don't really go like, oh, what? oh, this is disruptive. It feels totally organic to everything else that's been going on. And the other thing you mentioned is the way it hopscotches back and forth through time. It feels fl- just effortless. You're never well, confused yeah. about yeah. where you are. You're never yeah. confused. And it, everything seems to fall at the right moment. I mean, this 
you know, there's a big element of filmmaking, which is just magic. You know, this movie clearly had that magic, although obviously they had to go through hell to get it. But, yeah. you know, when things fall together, even if you have to work for it, there's a certain element of magic. But um, it was so interesting to learn that this was a salvage job because all those weird tangents and elements and flashbacks and some things that, you know, maybe don't even make sense in the new context. It maybe made a lot more sense, but you, you sort of buy them or whatever. It gave it all this richness. It becomes this tapestry that all sort of serves the bigger story. But well, you, if you sat down to write a linear story like that, probably never would have happened. And yeah. that's part of what makes the movie so unique. But I just wanted to say one thing. Like, I brought up the illustration about the cocaine story because, you know, they realized they needed a bridge to what's he suddenly doing in Los Angeles. So they, he wrote that scene and they went and shot it. Um, just to, to explain, oh, I'm going out to the coast to give an to award. Do, give an award. It's like that's that's why that scene's there. Um, so while they were editing the movie, they realized you know they needed these little moments and bridges and whatever. And even the opening uh, and closing um, narrate uh, monologue where he's just speaking to the camera. The way he was um, telling it in the book is like we realized we needed a line or we needed a setup or whatever. And we'd just hop in a cab and go down to wherever the stage was, and he'd scribble it out on an envelope in the cab on the way there, and he'd do it. And um, the the gray line about, I think we need the eggs or something. Right. Or, um, <laughs> yeah. It was at the end. He, he, yeah. And, um, and this could be Ralph Rosenblum, you know, self-aggrandizing, I don't know. But he's like, you know, he did the take. He did maybe one take of that. And he looked at me. And, you know, Woody Allen's natural inclination is to do many takes. And he said the way Woody Allen works and part of the reason why, like, you know, maybe he had the confidence to do that Marshall McLuhan bit is because every stammer, every cough, every beat of that is very deliberate and precise. Like his timing is, you know, we think of him always going, <clears throat> you know, but yeah. that's all extremely deliberate and, yeah. and concise. So, um, I think that all those years of stand-up and whatever he does, obviously, yeah, just, what gave him the confidence say. to do a three-and-a-half-minute master take. with, yeah. And, you know, props to the extra behind him who, like, played beautifully off him. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Not an extra. That and, guy was great. And oh, Marshall yeah, yeah. McLuhan, who's not even an actor. Who just well, Marshall McLuhan kind of botched his line. I don't know if anybody knows that. Yeah, he did a little bit. <laughs> but, no, I was going to say the same thing. I mean, I think, it's, I think all of that stuff is the timing comes from having done stand-up. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, I know a few people that have done stand-up and, like, they really know how to speak with a lot of, of you know, they know how to pace their, themselves when they speak. Yeah. Unlike myself, who <laughs> sits here and stammers. And it's because I probably haven't had enough honest tea. Wow. Well, speaking of. Well done. Honest tea. Nature made it right. We put it in a bottle. Refreshingly honest. Visit honesttea.com to find a distributor near you. You know what I could also use on a hot day like this? I could use a Hilliard's beer. Oh, that would be great. I wish you brought those over. I'm, I don't have any. I would have brought some of those. Oh, but, drank them but Hilliard's beer is brewed and canned in Seattle's Ballard neighborhood, but drunk everywhere. Visit their tap room Thursday through Sunday. You can get more info on them at hilliardsbeer.com. Are you okay? What's the matter? Are you all right? What? There's a spider in the bathroom. What? There's a big black spider in the bathroom. That's what you got me here for at 3 o'clock in the morning because there's a spider in the bathroom? Oh, my God. I mean, you know how I'm about insects. Oh. I can't sleep with a live thing crawling around in the bathroom. Just kill it. For God, what's wrong with you? Don't you have a can of Raid in the house? No. I told you a thousand times you should always keep a, a lot of insect spray. You never know who's going to crawl over. It was really uh, timely for me to revisit this movie right now because, as you know, I'm, li I'm trying to edit a movie that I made. Um, and I put myself in the difficult position of trying to edit my own movie, which yeah. is not smart and uh, a little bit out of necessity, but it's, it's, it's a discipline. Yeah. It's always a discipline. It's, it's even more difficult when you're doing it alone. Um, but this movie, Annie Hall, um, was an extreme example of really having to let go of a lot. And it sounds like it was, it was really interesting to read in the Rosenblum account that Woody Allen was pretty merciless about letting stuff go which, as we said, you know, he, he used it later, but he really knew how to um, kind of serve the narrative and was, was vicious about it. And that is a big part of editing and directing, is knowing what to let go. Um, and, it, and I guess they really, like, cut it to the bone and then started to feel like they could bring a few things back. So it's a great being 90 scene. minutes. 
Yeah, and it's short. Yeah. But the great scene with um, Christopher Walken, and I think one of his <laughs> first performances, yeah, yeah. if not his first on-screen performance, yeah. um, that whole thing had been cut out. And that was when he had the opportunity to bring a few things back. That's what he wanted to bring back. And it's such a great moment. Oh, that's so funny. Great moment. Yeah. That's a great moment. Yeah. Um, this is my room. Yeah. Anytime an adult man shows you his room, it's not I good. As, I think as an artist, you'll understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I also just loved, I mean... This movie so like turned me on. I mean, Annie Hall and Fellini are like the two movies that just like opened my mind and just made me want to make films and everything. And the thing about Annie Hall, it's um, you know we've already talked about it. it's very formally playful. I mean, I love you know it goes into animation in a moment. It's got all these cool split screens and yeah, like oh, right, yeah. him talking to the camera at weird moments like that whole scene where um, <laughs> it was just. Yeah, it, it it was it was um, it was so different. Like that scene where Annie, um, the Diane Keaton carried him. First of all, Diane Keaton is just so lovely and adorable. She's great. Yeah, she just yeah. makes that movie. Um, she comes home from her first analyst appointment and she's telling about, oh my god, you know, I cried and I. He's like, oh my god, I've been going to therapy for fifteen years <laughs> and I've never cried. You yeah. Know? And she tells him the dream about uh, Frank Sinatra was choking me. <laughs> right. He's right. like, oh yeah, because he's a singer. He's like, no, he had glasses. She said, You're choking me. He's like, you didn't mention he had glasses. <laughs> and then she makes that Freudian. Oh no, no, singer. It's singer because his last name his is. Last singer. name is Albie Singer. Yeah. Um, but then oh, she makes that friend right. said, my, my it's ruining my wife. He says, you said wife. He said, no, I said life. And he turns to the camera and like, you heard it, right? I'm not crazy. <laughs> right. And that's the thing. It's like you're watching that and it's you're just so like, it works. you know, you like nod your head like, yeah, yeah, I heard that too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't go like, what? Why is he doing that? You, you are just, I don't know. I don't know what it is. This is very strange that you get so sucked into it. I think some of the scenes, like when they go back to the childhood, you actually see them standing in the corner of the room, and so and, asking and questions. yeah, and like, you and that know. was an interesting choice. With the Tony Roberts was so great in that movie. I yeah. love that they both call each other Max. Just weird details and all these yeah. cool callbacks. But anyway, yeah. uh, that scene where um, uh, my aunt was such a lively dancer. She was going with personality. Oh, yes. Where it's clearly um, supposed to be young Tony Roberts talking to the aunt, but he's in the background doing yeah. dialogue for yeah. both of them. You yeah. know, and it's yeah. like. Just brilliantly um, staged, you know? It is. It's really remarkable, like, how easy this movie is to watch. And and when you look at it, I mean, in the hands of somebody who really didn't know what they were doing, it would have been such a bad movie. It would have been so just clumsy, and you it would have been tripping over its own... own yeah, which is an interesting thing. I mean, movies um, want to be hopefully what they're ultimately going to be. And I know that's such a vague statement, but I mean, this movie so obviously became what it was intended to be, even though Woody Allen clearly didn't know that. You know, yeah. I mean, that's so amazing to me. And, um, and you sounded a little bit like Woody right there. Thank you. And I'm wearing Woody-ish gl- glasses. It sounded so amazing <laughs> your, your pants aren't high enough, though. I noticed, like, really high pants. Like, but her wardrobe was, was so... Great. Oh, that's right. Real close. Those, those were her, her real clothes. Those were her clothes. And, and you could tell... That's the, actually where I was going, which is um, that the amazing thing about this movie is not only that all that comedy works and that the filmmaking is so original and so fresh and so fun, um, but that you totally believe that relationship and you end up getting emotionally invested in the relationship. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it made me want to cry at the end, you know? I, it's like, that's a great movie. That's, that's, that's that rare thing where it's got a... It's cinematically uh, rich and interesting, but also has that heart and soul mm-hmm. and, and veracity yeah. to it. And this is, you know, such an amazing example of it. And it's... I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine looking back on it that they that it didn't just scream in the dailies in the in the raw footage like hello diane keaton love story you know but <laughs> right, it, yeah. it wasn't obvious you yeah know? it's amazing yeah I mean, he was dating diane keaton at the time right yeah so that felt that's that's part of what makes it you know obviously feel so well, real that's why it's believable that they're together because they're together yeah so there's actors that are actor actors and there's some people that just are in movies and you know diane keaton not taking it away from me look at her in the godfather I mean, she's an amazing actor but she just has a certain real presence and charisma that is just totally authentic and totally enchanting. And um, every minute the camera is on her, I am just totally with her. I mean, I totally had a crush on her, and I still do, you know? Yeah. Uh, Ralph Rosenblum 
really tooted his own horn in this book about... Um, that's what, that's kind of what I remember from that book. Yeah. I read it right after school, and I remember thinking there was a lot of like back padding in that book. But it was yeah. just, uh, I, a really interesting read I, nonetheless. But I remember that impression reading yeah. it back then too, which is... And then I told Woody, this is what your movie right, is. You right. know? Yeah, <laughs> I was like, did you? Maybe overstating it. Yeah. I, it, it sounded like a wonderful collaboration. I mean, yeah. as an editor, like I could only dream of having that kind of relationship and that kind yeah. of fun of that process. Right. Um, I think his movies got a lot more boring, especially later on, and uh, almost lazy in... Um, there, I mean, first there isn't much editing in his movies anymore, and even you know the stuff that he was starting to do in Annie Hall and took further. I mean, he had a lot of style of letting people walk out of the frame and walking mm-hmm. out of the frame and the block. And there's a great scene which is so simple but so elegantly done with um, the Carol Kane character where. They're in bed together, and then he's like, I can't do it because he's obsessed <laughs> right, about right. the Oswald <laughs> conspiracy. <laughs> right. But it ends up being this beautiful 360 degree around the room where it follows him, and then yeah. at a certain point leaves him. She comes in, you know, he gave her a bit of business to go get a pack of cigarettes on the mantle so that she could enter yeah. the frame, and then the camera follows her, and then it comes back around, and he comes back. Like, one simple shot, but just exquisite, you know what I mean? Yeah, he was a huge influence on you in, in school. Do you still feel that way or have you kind of moved away from it or um i've i still consider woody allen you know if i had to name three filmmakers um you know he would definitely be in that three but um i don't run out to see every woody allen film anymore because i think that um every third one's good every third one i mean i saw his new one and it's good i mean you know half-assed woody allen is still better than most stuff but i just yeah, I remember watching this this Bob Whitey documentary about him recently, which was totally oh, yeah. fascinating, yeah. and how he still works. And you know, the guy makes a movie every year. Like, I, he's an inf- he's a he's an icon to me in the sense of like, he has the fantasy career. Where yeah. You just you know you make a movie, you spend one season writing, you spend one season shooting, you spend one season you know finishing and promoting, and then you start writing another one. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't that, even promote him. He doesn't even promote him. Nice. Yes. But yeah. that's just that's an ideal filmmaker. Life it is. Me. Yeah. Yeah. But he doesn't seem to care that much. I mean, he seems a little bored to me. And, and in the documentary, you know, it shows him writing on his old typewriter that's been broken in the same one he's written on for his entire career. And he actually, like, cuts sections out and staples them in. That's how he cuts and pastes. Really? And he's like, oh. yeah, I just write the first draft, and then the next time I see it is when uh, somebody hands me on the sides the day I'm shooting it. Uh, hands me on the sides the day I'm shooting it. And, and I know that's supposed, you know, that's supposed to sound impressive, and to me it just sounds like, yeah, I guess that's why your films feel like first drafts these days. You know what oh, I mean? It's like, I yeah. wish you cared a little bit more. But, um, but he's like my favorite filmmaker because of the humanity and the humor and the, the uh, cinematic quality of it. And um, the greatest compliment I, I've gotten that I can think of in a long time is uh, I screened my film recently, and a producer friend of mine who came to the screening, he said, you're like a Woody Allen, by which he meant the film is funny and also explores like philosophical issues, right? Um, which is a really difficult thing to try to pull off. Yeah, which, yeah. You know, you can't think of too many filmmakers who do that. Woody Allen's yeah. the one that comes to mind, and I'm not saying that I did, but, you know... No, but, I, you know, I, I haven't seen your movie yet, but I read the script a couple years ago, and I remember having that kind of response to yeah, it. Yeah, so. and thank you, but... With the script, you know, a lot of people like the script, but it's like, oh, it's a comedy that deals with religious issues or philosophical issues. Yeah. Like, oh, you know, nobody knows what to do with that. Like, that's that doesn't fit in a box. Right. And um, those films don't get made. Yeah. But Woody Allen is like the one American filmmaker that does that, and we love it. I mean, I feel like Woody Allen's last great movie was um, Crimes and Misdemeanors, which was such a beautiful blend of comedy and, like, really heavy drama. And yeah. We love that, you know, if yeah. it's done well. If it's done it, well. well, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's just so, so many great moments in, in Annie Hall. Oh, I was going to say, just to finish the editing uh, part of it, that, so yeah, Ralph sort of toots his own horn a little bit, but um, he makes a big deal out of it uh, that they, they, you know, sort of figured out what the movie wanted to be and what the main storyline was going to be and what the... Um, spine of how they were going to tell yeah. it was going to be, but they still had these issues to deal with, like those little bridges and moments, mm-hmm. and um, uh, what they could keep, what they could lose, but they couldn't figure out the ending, which is, I guess, always the issue. 
and they tried this and they tried that and they I, they maybe even shot some stuff I can't remember but this is where Ralph really chooses his own horn it's like he had the the brainstorm ah, I suddenly remembered that in the movie Diane Keaton's a singer and she's singing about uh, memories or what's it? it seems like old times mm-hmm. and oh, it was yeah, a song yeah, yeah it's like oh duh you know that we should just have a montage with her singing of all the memories from the movie and I. I was like so inspired, and I called my assistant, who ended up being Woody's editor for the next twenty oh. years, Susan Morse. Susan Morse, it's like, yeah. Grab me that clip and grab me that clip, which made me nostalgic because I feel like I was the last editor in Hollywood that ever worked on film, like right. digital editing yeah. was just coming in. So I like, I had the fun of you know, trims and stuff. Yeah. Which, by the way, people romanticize film. And oh, I know. Nostalgic about film. It's it's. it's not worth romanticizing. It just makes you <laughs> just makes you less creative. But the one thing I always loved about having little tr- you know shots on trims was that if you looked at a shot and you hated it, you could literally throw it into the hall, which I used to do all the time. This shot sucks. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that digitally. I mean, you know, you throw the trash. I guess you could throw. It's not the same as you know. Um, so anyway, so he like had this brainstorm and he put together this montage very quickly of. Remember this great moment where we were fighting lobsters and blah, blah, right, blah. Right, right. And put it to the song. And it's like, oh, and it just was beautiful. And it made the movie and made everybody cry. And having just read that and then watched the movie, I was like, it's kind of lame. Oh, that <laughs> segment? I felt. Yeah, it, was, it felt a little trite. Trite. Yeah. Did not. Yeah. Did not. But you match. mentioned the lobsters. Yes. And this is one of the things about this movie that I love is that there's a scene where Woody Allen and Diane Keaton are making lobsters for dinner. And I don't know why they have like a hundred of them, but there's a lot. The only, <laughs> the only handheld shot in the movie. What's that? The only handheld shot in the movie. That oh, was it. Really, they only had two lobsters. I thought there was more. It felt like there was like three or four, but they're they're they're, they're, they're like loose on the floor and they're Wait, three or four handheld shots or three or four lobsters. Lobsters. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And it felt like it felt like there was about a hundred of them, but there was for some reason it seemed like there was more lobsters than there were people eating them. But they're making this dinner and uh, and it's just this great fun scene where they're both afraid of the lobsters and they're maybe drunk and giggling and and just like ah oh, you get it you get it and you know it's like ah oh. hiding in the corner yeah and and he gets a tennis <laughs> so, racket yeah, maybe, out maybe if i put a a, a, oh, little a bowl, bowl of, of melted of butter and the lobster maybe they'll run out, out the other side <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, you know it's a really fun scene and then you see it echoed later when he's on a date with somebody else and he's trying to recreate this moment and she's just like, I don't get it. What's, and she's smoking a cigarette. It's like, you're, you're a grown man. Yeah, you're, you're a grown man. Pick up the lobster. Yeah. And, and it's she like, get his, is that a joke? Yeah. And, it, and it's just like so much stuff like that where it's like, oh, yeah, I, I've, I've, been in it. I've been in that scene. Yeah. I've been in that scene. It's and, really and, relatable. And, I, yeah. and also I think that was so cool. Like I was kind of conscious this time of – there's so many setups and callbacks in that movie. That's yeah. a, that's an yeah. excellent one. Yeah. There's a thing about the black soap, and then later on he's walking. It's cool, like he walks down the right. street right. and starts all of a sudden starts talking to strangers. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, oh, and look at this, this black soap. What is this about? You know, it's like yeah. stuff that he's set up. Um, there's the book when they, they go to the bookstore, and he's like, oh, I think you should have these books on fear and dying. And, and Instead then, of like, that cat book. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. And then, you know, later on, it's like when they're breaking up, they're like, you know, he finds those books again and then yeah. puts them in her box like oh these, these are yours but then i i think she takes, she, them, she out takes them out and, yeah and it's just like oh god if you sit down to try to write a relationship try to write a love yeah. story you can't write moments like that i mean i can't or you know i think most people can't and you had the sense in that movie that those were really well observed real moments that yeah. he had yeah. lived and yeah. was able to uh evoke you know in a really real way that it's just, it's remarkable, you know? Yeah. Well, anything else before we wrap it up? I just encourage anyone listening to this, if they have not seen Annie Hall, do yourself a favor. It's Absolutely. the greatest movie yes. ever made. Absolutely. It's fantastic. I, I, and I do have to say, when I, when I was a kid and it won the Academy Award for Best Picture, it was the same year that Star Wars came out. And I was like, really? Seriously? Really? It beat Star Wars? Are you kidding? Yeah. I'm still a fan of Star Wars. But... but. This, this is film great... is remarkable, if for nothing else, that Chris and I both agree it's a great movie. That's... Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> no, if you haven't seen Annie Hall, it, it's definitely, I think, Woody Allen's high watermark. And, and if I know there are people out there that don't like Woody Allen, but I think this, you'll, you'll this like will this probably one. change well, your it, mind. Actually, before you shut this off, can we just say, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting thing that... Um, oh, you know, we shut it off too late. We, that we've been talking about um, Woody Allen, the filmmaker, not realizing the movie he was making. 
And then now, like I mentioned to my mother, I'm coming over here, I'm going to talk about Alan Holland. She's like, oh, I don't like Woody Allen anymore ever since he married his daughter. Okay, oh, so right. now we know this about him. We can't look at his work the same way again, not to mention Manhattan, where there's this charming, yeah. innocent love story with him yeah. and an underage girl. Right. Um, and this he, movie had a line about uh, Tony Roberts' character with 16-year-old twins. I know. Oh, and that's yeah, supposed yeah, to be yeah, cute yeah, and funny. Yeah, By the yeah. way, just the merciless ragging on Los Angeles was right. hilarious. Yeah. And that great caveat with Jeff Goldblum, I forgot my mantra. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. um, but anyway, uh, it's just interesting that you cannot separate, especially if you put yourself in your movies, you cannot separate yeah. your, your life from the movies, yeah. as it should be. Well, try to separate your, your Woody from your life. and. <laughs> And, and watch Annie Hall because it is couldn't. worth it. Seems like old times. Well, uh, once again, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Honest Tea and Hilliard's Beer. If you're a movie lover and would like to support us, you can subscribe to the 2020 Film Club. Your annual subscription gets you into 10 of our monthly four-year consideration screenings here in Seattle and a ticket to our annual ceremony in February. It's over $100 value for only $40. Oh, my God. To be so lucky. To enroll, just visit us at 2020awards.org and look for the subscriber link. And until next time, remember, it's never too late to start thinking about the past. Just to have my